The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. I'm Soam Bose from the SLCAN Professional Development Committee. Today we have a presentation on aging environmental rooms, a sustainable op sustainability opportunity. As you know, in all webinars, on the right-hand side, under the chat screen, uh, uh, you could ask questions after the presentation. With that, I'll introduce our speaker, Jeff Mumford. Jeff Mumford is Vice President and General Manager at LabWorks International, Inc. He is a licensed professional engineer graduating from Carleton University's engineering program with a specialization in HVAC and controls. He also holds a Master of Business Administration degree from Sluchit School of Business at York University. Prior to joining LabWorks, Jeff was the Canadian Vice President for a Fortune 400 technology company. Jeff is an active member in several industry associations, including the International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers, ISPE, the Institute of Environmental Sciences and Technology, and the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, ASHRAE. Through these organizations, Jeff has contributed presentations, webinars, and white papers on design, installation, and operation of specialty environments. At LabWorks, Jeff is working on enhancing our solutions through the application of technology, energy efficiency, and user group. So thanks, Jeff, for agreeing to present, and take it away. Thank you, Sam. Uh, and you can hear me fine? Yes. Go ahead, right, Jeff. Great. Thank you, everybody. I'm uh, glad you could join us today. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this presentation to about 30 to 40 minutes and, and open it up afterwards for questions. Uh, you can log the questions, as Sam mentioned, in the system, and we will try to get to everybody uh, afterwards. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about a, a, an opportunity that I think goes largely unnoticed in uh, the scientific community, and that is the amount and operation of scientific grade environmental rooms in facilities. These can be research institutions, pharmaceutical production facilities, uh, universities, and, and healthcare, of course. Um, a, a bit of history. Um, earliest environmental rooms as we define them today, and those are science-based rooms, uh, started using ice for cooling when they needed it, uh, as there was really no other alternative. Um, and it was obviously not uh, the best system for maintaining anywhere near precise conditions. However, it was something they could use for some form of cooling. Uh, modern direct expansion refrigeration systems uh, started uh, by the uh, Carrier Corporation in the 1930s, uh, started to enable uh, the ability to use mechanical cooling to produce uh, more precise environments for uh, medical and research type environments. In the 1960s, uh, DuPont uh, invented polyurethane foam as we know it today, uh, which is a key component to, to building the environmental rooms, both, both everything from food service right up to our, our science-based rooms. And by the mid-1960s, um, panels as we know them today were starting to be produced uh, to produce a room which was very uh, thermodynamically tight and able to control, uh, produce uh, an environment where temperatures and humidities could be controlled to a, a fairly precise degree. Um, and and the, really the first controlled environment rooms in, in the modern sense of the term where control was very tightly regulated and where uh, they could be used for both experimentation and storage of critical materials were, were started in the US military as a lot of other things were. Um, in the early 60s and then commercialized um, across you know North America and around the world in Canada some of the early really early companies that started this were um, controlled environments or uh, Conviron out of Winnipeg uh, constant temperature control in Toronto and, and several others that began building these types of rooms when I talk about uh, environmental rooms uh, these are different than what you would consider a food service cooler, something you might find in a Tim Hortons or McDonald's or in a, uh, you know, a cafeteria or a large food service type organization. Um, environmental rooms are, are have um, very tight temperature control generally as a requirement. So you know, we see common requirements of half a degree Celsius plus or minus 
The other big element that's not common in, in other areas is they want you, is we need to provide uniformity across all locations in that room. Plus or minus one degree is very typical. That means that all product or, or processing that's occurring in the room happens at a very, in a very controlled way at a very controlled environment. And then on top of that, other factors can be added in there, factors such as humidity control, humidity uniformity. Um, we may run into conditions where there's adjustable requirements, whether uh, the room goes from cold to warm, warm to cold, or just has to be able to operate at multiple settings. Uh, typical to environmental rooms as opposed to storage rooms is we often have to provide ventilation as per ASHRAE because these spaces are actually occupied by researchers. Um, as soon as the space is considered occupied, we need to provide ventilation for that and that adds additional complications because we also have to maintain a very tight temperature tolerance. And then finally, uh, there needs to be some form of data recording or alarming that happens uh, as part of this overall process so that the rooms are uh, monitored and that we have a record of them performing as they have been expected to uh, over the period of time. Um, one of the key items that make these really a, a, a target in my mind for sustainability is the fact that, you know, if I was to characterize how these rooms run today, it's, you know, as if you were driving your car with your gas pedal straight to the floor and you were controlling the speed very precisely with the brake. So in essence, environmental rooms by all manufacturers today run with compressors running basically flat out all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, and achieving very precise temperature control by injecting hot gas into the process to regulate coil temperature. And that's the only way that uh, so far industry has been able to accomplish these very, very tight temperature tolerances. Uh, however, it does make these rooms uh, relatively energy intensive. If we move on and look at what are the key elements of a, a typical environmental room, uh, and all of these have an impact on sustainability, uh, we start with the insulated panel construction. So these are generally uh, four inches or more ins foam insulated panels. Uh, it can be polyurethane or polyisocyanary uh, foam insulation that is typically used, which has very good R value characteristics. Uh, there is typically a refrigeration system that is used that comprises of an evaporator, compressor, condenser, an expansion valve, and a bunch of other accessories that allow that refrigeration system to operate over a range of conditions and also at a very precise temperature control standpoint. Uh, electrically within these rooms, and, and on top of data and electrical outlets that are used for experimental purposes or whatever process is happening in the space, there is also the lighting of the space, which can be just ambient, but it also, in some instances, uh, particularly like growth chambers or tissue culture rooms, for example, that lighting may form uh, part of the overall process happening in the space. And then finally, there's some form of uh, control system that is monitoring and regulating the temperature, humidity, can, can be carbon dioxide content, can be a lot of different aspects in the room. Uh, and then ideally recording those values uh, for reporting and um, quality management purposes. So each of these environmental rooms, you know, in one form or another has all of these aspects uh, included in it. And each of them has a unique kind of contribution towards, um, you know, how we can think about sustainability and how these rooms might be able to be operated in a more sustainable fashion. So the first thing I, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, is energy consumption and really what is it that these rooms uh, require in terms of energy and, and we'll move on to the refrigeration, the panels. And finally, I'm gonna talk a little bit about noise because from a, an operation standpoint, it, it, it does impact the environment to, for the people that are working in it considerably and it is something that uh, has changed considerably over time as well. So if we look at a standard environmental room and we've done some research on consumption as we uh, continually modify and upgrade designs um, and we've gone back and actually physically monitored some of these systems. Uh, if we took an average uh, sized room in, in imperial measurements, eight feet by eight feet by eight feet, operating at four degrees Celsius, which would be a very common operating temperature for an environmental room. Pre-2000, using the compressor technology of the day, 
likely fluorescent lighting within the space um, and the typical operations. We found, uh, in general, the average around 38,000 kilowatt hours per year, uh, which in the province of Ontario, with time of day pricing and everything else, uh, works out to roughly you know $3,100 a year of operation costs per environmental room. Now you can imagine in a, a facility, and we've done a number of science facilities that have you know 10 to 20 rooms. Um, you know, you start running up to the thirty to sixty thousand dollars a year of utility costs just to operate the room itself, um, which which can be fairly significant, uh, and also has uh, contributing environmental factors to it, depending on how that electricity is generated. Uh, as we move to the more modern uh, or the newer rooms within the last fifteen years or so, twenty years, um, the total consumption, the compressor technology has got has gotten better. Uh, you start to see more efficient T5 type lighting in these rooms um, and some other factors, ECM motors on the evaporators, which are more effective, uh, more um, energy efficient. And, and we saw a, a, you know, a reasonably significant drop in energy consumption in the newer uh, rooms uh, down to the, you know, just under $2,400 a year, still fairly energy intensive, but uh, is, you know, considerably a, a bit better of an improvement in the overall operation. And then in, in the more uh, modern rooms and in the last, you know, almost 10 years, uh, you know, we, we took studied rooms typically five to 10 years in age, and we would find energy values uh, down around 24,000 kilowatt hours per year, or a um, total consumption cost of around $2,000 per year per room. Uh, which offered you know, a bit of savings overall in terms of overall operation. Adding to that is if you do ventilate these rooms, if they are considered occupied spaces, uh, you could add at least 20% to those numbers because there's an additional load on the room that continually has to be managed. Um, so you're, you're adding a bit more, but it gives context in terms of what the overall operational costs strictly from an energy perspective are for these rooms. And normally they do operate as I said, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, they're not used all that often in a on on off basis um, in places. So if I move on and I talk about the refrigeration impact of the rooms, um, if we go again back to pre 2010, the most common uh, refrigerant used in these rooms to pr produce the cooling was R22. Uh, R22 is an HCFC refrigerant, uh, which means it had a, a very high ozone depletion potential. And um, as a result of the Montreal Protocol and, and other efforts around the globe, um, its use was uh, stopped uh, prior after 2010 by most manufacturers. And in 2015, uh, it was entirely restricted for new equipment, so you didn't see it at all. Uh, coming up in January 1st, 2020, it will be completely restricted uh, for the purposes of these type of units and will no longer be able to be used. So there do exist uh, some rooms out there that we've come across that would be still running on R22 out there. Um, it's probably worth an audit in a lot of facilities to find out what system is running because uh, all, only from a continuity of operation standpoint, it is going to get to be very hard to uh, maintain operation of those units should there be a failure and it's generally better to proactively deal with it than it is to reactively uh, in the event of a problem. Starting in 2010 and through to today, the predominant refrigerants that were migrated to are R404A and R134, which are HFC refrigerants, which means they had much better ozone depletion potential uh, characteristics and were not going to cause uh, holes in the ozone layer necessarily. However, um, as we as time progressed and, and the focus uh, uh, from an environmental standpoint started to focus on global warming potential or greenhouse gases, uh, it was found that you know R404 in particular was very uh, had a very high global warming potential. So in other words, 3478 times worse than carbon dioxide um, for global warming potential. And so there was a, a focus on limiting its use and, and starting to look for better solutions. Uh, effective January 1st, 2020 in Canada, 
no new equipment can be provided in, in this business segment. No new equipment can be provided with our 404 or uh, 134A, and they need to move to a low w, GWP uh, solution. So um, we started a, a couple of years ago, and, and most manufacturers now are using one of the low GWP refrigerants. Uh, these can be uh, ones such as our 448A. Um, uh, Honeywell manufactured product called Solstice or R452A. Um, they have a much lower GWP rating. They're around 1300 um, and they are not currently scheduled for phase out. So they have uh, much better environmental properties than, um, than the previous products that in place. And um, they are also in a lot of cases convertible. So you can convert the R404 units with some a, a bit of work to uh, our 448A uh, refrigerant. Um, so from an ongoing operation standpoint, that will become important as the 404 replacement becomes restricted over the next several years and proactively need to think about how are these units gonna run with um, an environmental friendly solution. Next item I wanted to talk briefly about uh, are, is the condenser cooling. Um, we do still find instances where uh, environmental rooms use domestic water to drain for cooling their air conditioning condensers. Uh, places use this because it was inexpensive to put in place initially from a capital perspective. Um, and they really maybe didn't have a lot of other alternatives at the time. Uh, however, today, most jurisdictions, this is not permitted. Um, you know, and, and if the the municipality becomes aware of it, they'll obviously make you stop immediately. Uh, in addition, it is very expensive. Uh, water does cost uh, a, a reasonable amount of money and running cooling water through a condenser 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year is an expensive way to cool it. So um, we're seeing most of those have been changed over, but there are some that still exist. New installations generally use process water from the chilled water system to cool the condensers. Um, it, it does work well um, and it, it is effective in terms of cooling. The downside to that is it does require your chillers in the building to operate year round, uh, which may or may not be uh, uh, required for the rest of your building. And in some cases, especially the new lead buildings, we have implemented systems where they use uh, low grade heating water for cooling the condensers, which really has the environmental benefit of capturing all the heat that's being rejected by the energy to cool those rooms and repurposing it to heat the building. So in other words, you have no waste heat and um, it becomes very efficient in terms of uh, repurposing all of that uh, lost energy into something uh, the building can use. And then finally, in a lot of smaller installations where you don't have large process water, there are air-cooled units that sit outside the building um, and the heat is just rejected outside. So, you know, there's no recapturing of that heat, but however, it is not necessarily uh, a waste of energy in terms of using domestic water or some other system like that to cool it. Another factor which in, impacts the sustainability of these rooms are in fact the insulated panels themselves, which the, the building or the room is made from. Uh, as I mentioned previously, they're generally made from either poly uh, foam polyurethane or polyisocyanate, uh, which are two different chemical properties, sandwiched between either galvanized steel or aluminum skins. Um, we do see in some buildings due to building um, uh, code requirements, occasionally mineral fiber panels, so galvanized skins with mineral fiber install insulation. That mineral fiber typically is about half the insulating value of the foam. It's not nearly as good. It also has pretty terrible humidity properties in terms of it does not restrict humidity transfer at all. Um, and so where possible, we do try to avoid that, but in some cases with building permit requirements, it's unavoidable. Um, the newest installations are up around 7.8, R7.8 per inch. So on a four inch panel, you're at around R30. Um, which gives you a fairly good uh, insulation value for that room. Um, previous to year 2000, panels were manufactured using HCFC blowing agents. So if you picture the foam, it they actually have a gas that blows through the foam material 
that expands it and uh, that that's how they fill the panels. Uh, a lot of that gas is not uh, captured, so it's released to the environment. And so it is a pretty unsustainable um, process as far as it does release a lot of um, the agent they use for blowing. In the past, it was uh, 245FA, which is a, an HFC-related um, material and had a reasonably high global warming potential factor. Uh, all Canadian manufacturers in January, if they haven't already done so, are moving to new low GWP, and, and the one most commonly used is a product called 1234ZE, which is a zero, uh, near zero global warming potential gas uh, and much more environmentally friendly. So any of these panels produced today have a, a much lower uh, environmental footprint as a result of how they're produced uh, from a foam agent. That being said, uh, obviously some of the biggest opportunities to um, sustainably uh, use these rooms is not to replace the panels at all, but to reuse them where possible. Uh, they generally, you know, a well-maintained panel does not have a lifespan. It can be used indefinitely. And in a lot of cases, some cosmetics can be easily fixed up on them. So you're not necessarily producing new panels. You don't need to. And finally, um, Sound uh, is one of the environmental impacts that, well, uh, you don't think of it necessarily in terms of uh, long-term pollution of the environment. Uh, the near-term pollution of the environmental space around where the people are working and, and the comfort level of the space is highly impacted. Uh, environmental rooms are notor notorious for being uh, quite loud. Uh, to create the level of airflow required for uniformity and the type of systems that are used. Um, environmental rooms would typically operate close to 80 decibels, um, which is about the same as standing beside a vacuum cleaner and uh, on the edge of the limits of most of the occupational health and safety upper limits of where you're allowed to work without damage. Um, so they're not necessarily pleasant environments. Uh, some of the newer rooms uh, have come out with uh, some pretty advanced fan design, and you can see in the, in the small snip I've included in this, that's a sample uh, of one of manufacturers' uh, low pressure, sound pressure fan design. And while it produces the same amount of air volume, uh, it uses motors that will consume 30% less energy while doing it and will reduce the overall sound pressure level by almost 25%. Uh, so if, we're, if you look here and see that we are down in the 60 decibel range uh, of operation from 80, and noting that's a logarithmic scale, uh, a 60 decibel room is very comfortable from a sound level standpoint versus where it would have previously been. And there does exist an opportunity to go back and look at some of the uh, previously older rooms and consider retrofitting them to produce a much more high quality environment for the people working in them uh, from a sound level and at the same time incorporating some energy savings uh, at the same time. So if we do consider, you know, how do we take these um, largely energy intensive spaces that uh, are, are needed and are very important to the processes that go into the building, but potentially um, have an opportunity to uh, produce a much better environment uh, with a little bit of effort that might have to be done regardless, uh, there are some great opportunities to consider to be upgrading these, these spaces as opposed to um, operating them as is and or um, necessarily having to buy brand new ones. Um, so the first thing I mentioned previously, the process of, of um, manufacturing insulated foam panels uh, is, is reasonably energy and, uh, and ecologically unfriendly. You know, a lot of metal that goes into it, the foam uh, that goes into it is not degradable. Uh, the agents that's used to produce the foam panel um, are more friendly today than they were in the past. However, all of that process does require energy. And quite honestly, they, they, you know, with a bit of, as long as they've been reasonably maintained, those units can be reused or repurposed in a way that, um, you know, can still produce a, a good outcome um, at a much lower environmental impact. Um, the second item is replacing the refrigeration system. And this is something that uh, any facility managers needs to be aware of. The, most of these controlled environment rooms that are over 10 years of age uh, will have a refrigerant problem 
and we'll need to have some form of upgrade done. Um, there are some drop-in refrigerants, so your local refrigeration contractor could potentially drop in a, a new environmentally friendly refrigerant with some minor changes to the refrigeration system. However, uh, you may miss out on the opportunity to use much higher efficiency compressors, uh, introduce um, you know, the lowest level of GWP refrigerants, so you don't have a you know, you're buying yourself a much longer uh, life cycle before you have to look at them again. Um, it can be considered, can we, can that condenser be connected to a building system to recapture the heat that it's produced, if it's possible? And then finally, in the refrigeration system, consider the use of new evaporators, which would have um, ECM or electrically commutated motors, which would be more efficient and fitted with low sound fan blades to produce a much more desirable space to work in uh, produce the same outcome in terms of temperature control and and reliability um, and and produce a much you know nicer space as a whole and then some of the obvious ones if they haven't already been done is is simply the use of new led lighting technology um, can with occupancy sensors can really reduce uh, the amount of energy uh, i'm sure many people have walked past their environmental rooms and seen them running flat out with the lights on um, and the ability just to have those off and off operate on an occupant basis, um, just offer some additional savings. And in the end, a, a lot of these upgrades can provide a payback that um, you know, will help justify some of the work uh, that might have to be done regardless in terms of replacing your refrigeration system um, to, meet, um, to keep it operational. Uh, and, and lastly is the, uh, the control system. There's a lot of, uh, if, if you, I go back to some of the earlier uh, photos included in the presentation, you'll see in the past there were a lot of chart paper chart recorders that were uh, deployed on these systems 10 years ago and earlier. Um, and while they do a nice job of keeping track of uh, temperatures and conditions in the room, they do require a lot of maintenance. Uh, and I can't tell you the times I've walked past and seen a chart recorder rotating with the paper torn in half and the pens dry and basically just running, but no, no data or any use coming from it. Um, it's relatively straightforward to convert to new control systems. Uh, multiple manufacturers provide them, and they have a great bunch of features, and included in them is the ability to store data over a long period of time, typically years at a time, um, and also be able to access that data remotely and use it in a much more uh, usable format in terms of you can download it in a flat file and then analyze it if you need to. Uh, the other big one that's often missed is control sensors should be calibrated with maintenance annually, and I know that's not done on nearly often enough. Um, even the best control sensors in the world have drift uh, that is introduced over time, and they need, it needs to be corrected by a calibrated instrument. Um, and so by continually recalibrating your sensors, you get much better operation of your space. Uh, you also may save a lot of energy because if your calibrated sensor is, is shifting lower reading um, temperatures so it's producing a, a colder environment, you may be using more energy than really is required for what you're, you need the space for. And so the business case, so why would, uh, why would you want to do this? Um, you know, if we took a typical 8 by 8 room, the capital cost to, to completely rebuild that room in place uh, could look something like this, um, you know, a, a brand new refrigeration system with a high efficiency compressor, new low GWP refrigerant, um, low sound pressure evaporator fans, all of the uh, performance characteristics that you would want in these type of rooms would run around $14,500. Uh, you could upgrade the lighting for another $620 with complete LED uh, vapor proof fixtures um, of a category suitable for this environment with the temperature ranges, and a controls package for around $3,800 that would give you a lot of the benefits of a new control package over what was there previously. So a total cost of around just under $19,000 for an upgrade on a room that if you were to purchase it brand new would cost you in the range of $50,000. So significant savings um, with all the benefits of uh, a new operating room in terms of lifespan and everything else. And, and certainly the panels, if there was some cosmetic um, conditions, could be dressed up to produce a, a newer type environment. Uh, and on that, you could expect, even over a typical 15-year-old environmental room, uh, energy savings alone of $1,500 a year 
uh, which you know would give you a 12 or 13 year payback, which may not sound fantastic, but when you combine that with the fact that no matter what, in many cases, the refrigerant will have to be upgraded and you're going to have capital costs associated with that, whether you want to or not, um, now you are, instead of just spending those costs and having what you have, you actually have a chance to upgrade and produce a much better work environment for your staff, a much lower energy intensive uh, area, and, and you know, a vastly improved uh, amount of accuracy and reliability of the entire system. So a fairly straightforward thing to do on something that quite honestly is something that most people who have controlled environment rooms today are going to need to address uh, over the next several years uh, if their rooms are not you know, less than 10 years old. So with that, um, I, I can open it up for anyone who has questions on the line or uh, any other comments as associated to this. Thanks, Jeff, uh, for the excellent presentation. Uh, it's, it, it was a 360 degree view of uh, the aging environmental rooms, uh, covering history, efficiency, manufacture, maintenance, um, you know, sound issues with the environmental rooms and all. Uh, uh, th thanks for that presentation. Uh, as I said before, if you have questions, there is a chat box on your right hand corner. Uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions on that. Uh, Jeff, I may start asking um, with, with that presentation that um, uh, it's interesting that uh, the water-cooled condenser, uh, water-cooled uh, environmental rooms had a huge jump in efficiency, almost 55% over uh, from 2010 to, you know, the, in the recent days. Um, what, uh, what uh, in, in, in terms of, in terms of uh, uh, the type of environmental rooms, in terms of planning, uh, let's say a contained environmental room versus, let's say uh, some of the environmental rooms may have like a, a, a section where you're, you know, you're uh, loading the environmental rooms for storage and on the other side you have unloading and there's doors there. So in terms of planning an environmental room, is there a big impact or is there any research about um, uh, the the loss of energy uh, in how an environmental room is planned with uh, you know uh, let's say uh, not just one door but several doors with uh, you know sliding doors or glass doors is there any study related to that? So when good question, Sam. Um, when most uh, environmental room manufacturers are asking clients in terms of what they want for a room, some of the the very leading questions we have to begin with are. Uh, how many door openings will you have per hour or per day? Um, what type of material is being loaded into the room and what are the what is the entering temperature and the exiting temperature of that material and how much of it will move in on a daily or, or weekly basis? And what we're trying to do is establish what is the total load that room may uh, take in terms of um, the uh, material load that's in there, but also from the characteristics of, of the door entries and exits. And as we get into process type rooms where you do have a large number of entries and exits and, and material flowing through the room, uh, we do get into other other uh, items that can make a big difference. And those include things like air curtains, uh, where we try to limit the amount of air that can enter the space um, through that process of moving material in and out. Um, and while the air curtain itself does generate some uh, energy consumption, uh, containing the preconditioned air has a has an incremental benefit. So it, there's a, there's a trade-off. But if you're at a certain tipping point, if you're moving material in and off out often enough, that those air curtains start to have a real uh, benefit, both from a performance standpoint and even from an energy standpoint. Thanks, thanks, Jeff, for that um, for that clarification. Um, I don't see any questions coming through from the attendees. Um, if there are no other questions, um, oh, I see a question now, okay. Uh, would the retrofit work have to be done by the original supplier of the environmental room? Uh, generally, no. Most, most manufacturers can retrofit uh, an environmental room uh, of another manufacturer's uh, uh, construction, um, you, you, you know, 
it is a case by case standpoint. It, it does matter, matter how much space is available, where it's installed, and, and generally, um, I would recommend that you know someone would contact a manufacturer of their choice, have them look at the space themselves, and and determine what the requirements are. I think most of us, and I, you know, I'll speak for our industry as a whole, because there's not all that many of us. Uh, I think all of us would be happy to come out and take a look at a, a space and, and provide some options as that relates to what's available. Um, because in general, the, the one thing about uh, environmental rooms is they are largely custom and there's a lot of individual characteristics on each site that we need to look at to ensure that uh, that retrofit is both makes sense from an operational perspective uh, and is done properly. But yeah, I would think any, you know, it, you are not stuck with the manufacturer who installed it for you, you probably have options. Thanks, Jeff. That that helps with the flexibility of uh, you know looking at different uh, vendors and manufacturers to upgrade the environmental room. Um, in terms of an upgrade, are there any code impacts uh, to retrofitting an existing environmental rooms? I guess uh, there are specific codes related to uh, you know fire alarms and uh, exiting uh, access control. Could you speak to that if uh, those are, um, you know, something to pay attention to and uh, uh, if you have come across a scenario like that? Yeah, that's a, good, that's a great question. And, and actually, I might almost turn it back to you as being the architect in the, in the conversation. But um, generally, so a retrofit has to be done to meet current codes for the material that we're providing. Uh, for example, we can't go in and retrofit it with a refrigerant that's no longer supported or we're not allowed to sell. Um, similarly, you know, there's ASHRAE codes around lighting and uh, building code requirements around uh, efficiency of lighting, et cetera. Uh, where it does get a little bit gray are on things like fire alarm uh, compliance, um, things like, um, you know, exiting and, and uh, whether or not the location of where the room is is, um, is properly located for exits, et cetera. And that falls into, you know, for example, if you were doing a renovation in a, in a building, um, at some point that renovation, depending on the size, will require you to upgrade that portion to modern building code standards from the code standard it was built at. Uh, generally, to upgrade an environmental room, you're not subjecting yourself to upgrading to building code standards, but you are limited to um, the standards for the equipment that you're installing for the, as I said, for the lighting or the refrigeration or or those items that are impacted. Thanks, Jeff. That's interesting because some of the some of the municipalities have uh, uh, you know a threshold above which, if you are uh, you know undertaking a renovation, then it needs to be met it needs to be meeting the latest codes. But uh, as you say, uh, based on uh, codes related to an equipment or a device, uh, you will have to upgrade if uh, that is there that is existing uh, for an equipment a code uh, requirement that's existing for equipment. Um, I am. Um, so we don't have any more questions from the group. So uh, if we don't have questions, I'm gonna I'm gonna thank Jeff uh, for the presentation. It was an excellent presentation, and uh, as you all know, the presentation will be available. A video recording of the presentation will be available to all members of SLCAN. With that, uh, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for making the time to make a presentation. Thank you, Simon. Thanks, everybody in line. I appreciate you attending. Thank you.